One of the most widely used survey questions that I'm going to base a lot of what I talk about evidence on is asking people overall how satisfied they are with their life these days, or words to that effect. It you know, kind of varies from survey to survey, but that's the kind of essence of the question. How satisfied are you with your life? On a scale between 0 and 10. In survey data, typically the averages are 7 point something. Right? They kind of you know, change a little bit over time. Um, and in the UK over the last decade, you know, sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 here and there. But they're kind of around the seven and a halves, 7.7, 7.6s. If, if we look at tens of thousands of people over decades, ask them that question about how satisfied they are with their life, and then find out all sorts of other stuff about them. What other stuff about them has the biggest effects on the scores they give? The first thing to say as an academic is that we, we, we always caveat what we say with we're trying to establish causal mechanisms, right? I want to show something causal about the effects of jobs, health, housing, income on happiness. I don't want a correlation because that correlation could also mean that happier people have better jobs, nicer houses and so on, right? What I want is a causal effect. I want to, I want to establish the treatment effect of having more money or, or a better job or a nicer house, better health on people's happiness. And it's hard to establish causal mechanisms without randomized controlled trials, right? What I'd love to be able to do is to randomize people to different income levels or to different health status. Money doesn't make people happy unless you're poor. Poverty makes people miserable. And I'm now going to start drawing attention to what I think is then going to be the fundamental thing that I want to say to you, which is about the role of attention. The reason, part of the reason why the lack of money makes people miserable is because they're paying attention to not having enough money. They're paying attention to whether they can pay the bills, feed the kids, service the debt. It's a very attention-seeking condition. As people get richer, it's, then it becomes truer that money doesn't make people happy. When you get to sort of average levels of income or a little bit above, the relationship then between happiness and income becomes very flat. Because, largely because, you cease to be paying attention to something in a negative way. Interestingly, some of the evidence suggests, and this is kind of a little bit um, unclear, or the evidence is mixed, I should say, that at very high levels of income, happiness levels might start to fall again. And I think this is, again, due to an attentional phenomenon. That you then start paying attention to money have I got the right stocks and shares? Do I have the right portfolio? Have we bought a big enough house? All these things that draw attention to themselves, not always in positive ways. And I think that income, when you want to when say how people should interpret evidence on income, is that if anyone watches football or actually any sport where you have a referee, often people will say the refs had a good game because he or she wasn't seen, right? So they didn't really notice the ref in the game. And I think that's what income is like for us or ought to be like for us, right? When you're not paying attention to it, you probably have just enough money. When you're paying attention to it, you're probably not paying attention to it in good ways, certainly not when you're poor and maybe not even when you're rich. So that's income largely dealt with. But the fundamental point I want to make is that when you say anything, does anything make someone happy? I say, well, it depends on how much attention you pay it. So when uh, people have talked about the determinants of happiness, they've talked about the role of income in explaining happiness. That's a bit like trying to explain how many widgets a firm makes by just looking at the inputs of land, labor, and so on. But there's a production process in the middle, yeah, that converts those inputs into the outputs. You can produce more widgets by having more inputs and also by having a more efficient production process. There's a production process of happiness that has been largely absent from our academic you know, kind of conversations and that I talk a lot about in Happiness by Design, which is the production process of attention. Right? All, of, all of those inputs convert into happiness through the role of attention. Whether and in what ways and for how long, whether it's positively, negatively, and so on, the attention you pay to it determines how much that input affects your, out, your outcome of happiness. Just like the production process of inputs producing the number of widgets. So all the answers to all the questions will be, it depends on how much attention is paid to it and in what ways. And I think income is one of those things you don't want to be paying attention to. Health is a fundamental determinant of people's happiness. Mental health in particular, much more than physical health. 
Why? Because by and large, not always and everywhere, people get used to physical functioning problems in a way that they don't to mental health problems, right? Mental health problems that continually draw attention to themselves, right? If you've got a, if you were to have a injury that made you less mobile, insofar as that wasn't very painful and drawing attention to itself, you would adapt relatively quickly to that. But mental health problems, anxiety, depression, you don't get used to them. You don't get less depressed after a year than you were after a day. It constantly draws attention to itself. And if we're going to use happiness data to inform policy, that's not what I'm here to talk about today, then we would give much greater priority to mental health conditions than we currently do because of the constant attention-seeking nature of those conditions. Housing quality. How, it's interesting. We don't really have much on housing quality. We have, we have on whether you rent or own. Lots of data on that. Some data showing that whether people own, uh, some data sometimes showing that, that people that own their own homes are happier than those that aren't, but not always and everywhere. What else? There was jobs. I mean, unemployment is actually one of the biggest and longest lasting effects on people's happiness. Again, if you're thinking about policy interventions, then mitigating the harm of unemployment. Ha um, unemployment scars even when you're back in work again. And we think that's because, again, a, a kind of attentional phenomenon around security, right? If I've lost my job once, I can lose it again, even though I'm now back in work. So from a standard economic metric, you've got someone back in work, everything's fine, they're earning more money. But from a well-being perspective, they're less happy than they would have been had they not lost their job in the first place. I, I would advise you, in, in surprise this is going to be some sort of self-help class, um, if you're thinking about quitting something or doing something or you know leaving a job, leaving a partner even, that's where it gets a little dodgy, um, do it. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> because of our ability to make sense of stuff. Um, actually, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up about something else. Hands up if you're now with somebody as, a, you know, as your partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, wife, husband, who's less good than someone you were with previously. <laughs> Go on, be honest. No? No one? Well, yeah, this really turns to whether you make it public or not. That's a really, uh, of course. But even in private, even in private, most people won't think they are because we have an amazing capacity for cognitive dissonance. We could, we're able to interpret and understand things and explain things. That's the key part to adaptation is explanation. And when you have uncertainty, you can't explain uncertainty. There's no resolution to uncertainty through explanation. So you have to resolve the uncertainty and then you can move on. Part of the reason why we see in the happiness data around marriage and separation and then when you get the divorce is that there's an uptick after the separation ends because the separation is an attention-seeking phase. Will we get back together again, won't we? Divorce is final, done, move on. We, we have an extraordinary ability to get over stuff um, in ways that we're not often able to forecast very, very well. That's uh, good things and bad things. But the next, the next layer beyond the conditions and circumstances is um, our selves and identities, our personalities, our expectations, the kinds of people we are, whether we're introvert, extrovert, um, whether we have construct identities and stories. A lot of our lives are lived in narratives and stories about ourselves and about our lives. What role do they play in, in our happiness. We don't have actually lots of good data on many of these identities. It's much, it's much easier to ask people questions about their income and about their health, or it's just been more routine to do that over time than it has to ask them questions about um, themselves, their attitudes, beliefs, and so on. Um, in the personality, I don't know if people are familiar with the personality uh, dimensions. You can, you can think of the, f the, the, there's a kind of big five um, that you might think of as ocean, which is openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Uh, unsurprisingly, neurotics are less happy. Um, extroverts report being um, happier than introverts. We, we don't have very much good data, but of course, how we, how we deal with our conditions and, our, and how we deal with our circumstances will be a function of our expectations and the kind of people we are. Um, we have, you know, some data showing this would be unsurprising that if you move up the social mobility ladder, um, there are some small gains, but moving down the social mobility ladder, there are significant losses, 
right? Much greater than the gains from moving up, right? Moving down generally is a bad thing, right? To see your income fall by 10% compared to rise by 10% is much, much more painful. I want to then move on to the next layer, which is what we do, right? And when we start measuring happiness in the ways that I advocate in Happiness by Design, which is much more experiential, much more about asking people how happy they are when they're going about their daily lives, right? Not when they're reflecting on how satisfied they are with it, whatever that answer might mean in the two seconds that it takes them to answer it. But when we, when we drill down into finding out what people do, who they're with, and what they're thinking about in their minds, then I think we get a better and more rich, rich measure of the flow of experience. Um, and as anyone who's seen Happiness by Design knows that I talk about pleasure and purpose as the twin sets of experiences. We're not only interested in being happy in a fun sense, but we also want to be happy in a fulfillment, worthwhileness, meaningful sense. And happy lives are ones that contain the right balance between those two things. But when we look at the activities that people engage in, most of the evidence is, is really obvious, but overlooked in the sense that Everyone, when I, when I say the following things to you, you're going to say, no shit, Professor the LSE is telling me that. Um, and I'll say, well, why aren't you doing more of it then? Right? And again, I need to be careful because there's significant variation across individuals. Right? Any, anyone who says there's a one-size-fits-all approach to happiness is probably selling you snake oil. So my one-size-fits-all approach to happiness is to say that listen to more music. I mean, the, the evidence on music is is overwhelming I mean it literally lights the whole brain up um, in ways that no other stimulus can and not only at the time that you're listening to the music but for, but for some time there, there thereafter listen to music that you enjoy obviously that not someone else forces you to listen to um, <laughs> like your parents or something um, I'm trying to get my kids to like the music I like it's really hard um, I will win um, in the end um, so they can be their authentic selves uh, <laughs> what was I talking about? Right, yes. So, music. Um, laughter. That's a, I mean, that's a really... It's really interesting that we can prescribe laughter on the NHS now. Social prescriptions for laughter. It's kind of good on, good, good on the one hand that, that it's evidence-based, but a bit sad on the other hand that you need a prescription to laugh. Obvious but overlooked, right? We're not building it into our daily, daily lives and daily experiences. Um, going outdoors. Being around nature, biophilia it's called. That's, you know, that's kind of good for us, even in ways that we might not predict. Having new experiences. That's, that's the reason why time passes so slowly for kids. Because every day is a new experience to them. When you get to our ages, every day is the fucking same. It's like waiting for death. Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I've still, I've still got, I still have to come to death, don't I? Um, uh, I'll finish, finish on death at the end. Um, leave you with a really positive note to go away on. Um, Help other people. I cannot impress upon you enough how selfish helping other people is and how we should be celebrating that selfishness much more than we do. And actually, this is where we do have good randomized control evidence that if you tap into the personal benefits of pro-sociality, you get more of it for longer. If you draw attention to volunteers, the benefits that they're going to get from volunteering, they help other people for more and for longer. And yet we have this narrative around charity of it being something that is a hierarchy, that at the top of this hierarchy is the sort of self-flagellation, the cleansed of any personal benefit, altruism. I think that's harmful. It's harmful for getting more pro-sociality. Um, so being more transparent, it's really interesting that I can observe lots of things about you, right? Um, obviously age and race and so on, but also probably your income levels and you know, other, other things. But how generous you are is something that's unobservable. <laughs> Right? Um, if we make it more transparent, we would get more of it. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.